it's a privilege to be uh, invited to speak, even though it's a bit of an awesome uh, responsibility. Um, being asked to speak about um, Islam, even, even a narrowly defined topic, which is carefully crafted as offering some perspectives, sort of reduce your expectations, just offering some perspectives on Christian-Muslim relations is like being asked to explain um, the Anglican Church to an ecumenical partner. Um, Islam is diverse, Christianity is diverse, Anglicans are certainly diverse, and so all I can really, if, if, if I succeed in offering you some helpful perspectives which trigger some conversation and inspire you to work a bit harder at interfaith relations, I'll be satisfied with, with my uh, job tonight. Um, some of you will know straight away what that image on the screen represents. It's across. It's the rock at the heart of the Dome of the Rock at the Haram al-Sharif uh, in Jerusalem, Al Quds. And in the Jewish and Christian and Islamic tradition, this is the rock of Abraham. This is the rock on which Abraham was believed to have sacrificed or almost sacrificed Isaac or almost sacrificed Ishmael, depending on the tradition. And, and, of course, it's also believed to have been the rock where the altar stood during the time of the first and second temple. And I've got it there because I wanted, I wanted an image to begin with which would reflect um, the privilege I've had of accessing um, and getting to know um, something of the life of the, um, both the Christian and the Islamic and also the Jewish communities um, in the Middle East, particularly in Israel-Palestine. As was mentioned, I was Dean of St. George's College from um, late 2015 to early 2017. I've, I've had many opportunities to travel and live and work in the Holy Land. My particular research interests are, are the coins from the Bethsaida excavations, but within that particularly the Islamic coins, and I have a particular interest in the, um, in the Arab presence in the land whether that be uh, Christian Palestinians or Muslim Palestinians. I've also been studying Arabic with varying degrees of success for several years, and all of that in a kind of a sense was an unexpected preparation to become the media tart of Grafton in the aftermath of the Christchurch shootings, of course, in March of this year. So I, I did have some perspective to bring to those um, seemingly never-ending conversations with the media pack at that time. Once you unpack this phrase that I've chosen to use as the title uh, for this talk this evening, it comes from one of the surah um, in the Quran. It's the surah al-Ma'idah, which means uh, the surah of the table, which uh, as a good old-fashioned high church Anglican, Eucharistically focused Anglican, I love the idea that there's a surah where the table is the metaphor, Ma'ida. And we have this, this brief excerpt, which is in um, Surah 5, uh, <coughs> verse 82. You will find the nearest of them in affection to the believers are those who say, we are Christians. This is because among them are priests and monks and because they are not arrogant. And, and actually the last few words I think are just as important as the opening line. Okay avoiding arrogance and embracing an attitude of humility and openness and spiritual hospitality, I think, is really important. So what I'm hoping we'll do tonight is encourage each other to move more uh, confidently from any, any position we might have which is tainted by fear to a position which is overwhelmingly um, influenced by a sense of deep affection which is not to ignore the differences, but to focus on what we share. Certainly hope we'll be able to affirm the shared inheritance of what was sometimes referred to as the Abrahamic family of faiths, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. And indeed it's one of the tenets of Islam, one of the tenets of the Quran, that this is a single, a single line of prophets. And of course, Christians get a bit nervous when someone suggests that Muhammad has replaced Jesus, but then Jews get a bit upset when we say Jesus has replaced Moses. It goes with the territory. No one likes to have their prophet trumped. 
by a later iteration in the line of profit. So I hope we'll be able to reclaim some of the shared inheritance we have as sons and daughters of Abraham and Sarah. So I said not overlooking our differences. They are significant. Otherwise, we wouldn't be three different religions. We do have differences, but I think we'll be able to see we have a great deal in common. And so while I will not be directly speaking about the Christchurch massacre and the fact that the shooter came from a little town just north of Coffs Harbour, which can remain unnamed like the shooter himself, it of course, everything I say is relevant to the kind of issues which we all encountered in the aftermath of the Christchurch terror attack. Um, understanding and affirming what we have in common is, is, I think, is very important in terms of our sense of sympathy and empathy and identity with one another. But as always, viva la différence, it's the things where we differ which make us interesting. Okay, I'm told that 99% of my DNA and probably yours is common with a cockroach. But thank God for the differences. You wouldn't have come here to listen to a cockroach this evening. So I hope we will discover new inspiration to work and play together as children of God. Perhaps um, a little bit of demographic information might be helpful just to, just to kind of scan the terrain and, and sort of um, firm up our terms of reference. The earliest contact between the Muslim world and the continent of Australia was in the northwest of Australia in the pre-European period of our 60,000 years of human presence in this land. Okay. In other words, there were Muslim traders coming from what today we would call Indonesia, Malaysia and the Philippines, and they were coming down to the northwest coast of Australia. We have to say it wasn't typically a happy uh, commercial enterprise. There's uh, evidence of some atrocities and other things happening. Um, but the first, the first Muslims to set foot in Australia were in fact Muslim fishers and traders on the northwest corner of the continent. When we come down to um, European presence in this <coughs> ancient land, of course we're talking about the colony of New South Wales where the British dumped their unwanted convicts when they could no longer send them to North America because the wretched Americans had rebelled and they weren't taking any more convicts, just like uh, Asia is no longer taking our trash. The first significant census was the census of 1828 and it reports 10 Muslims in the colony in 1828 just a few years after the Bank of New South Wales was formed in, I think from memory, 1815, if I remember my high school um, uh, Bank of New South Wales passbook. Of course, they were referred to as Mohammedans, which is not an appropriate <coughs> label for a Muslim, but we understand what the cultural context was at that time. Scanning down less than 10 years, we find an, an interestingly overlooked part of local history. The first non-Indigenous person to live on the North Coast here, particularly in our area, was in fact a Muslim, Sheikh Brown. He had various other names as well. He was originally from Mumbai, I believe. He'd found his way to the United Kingdom. He got into trouble with the authorities. He was sentenced to death, but that was commuted and he was sent to the colonies. He was somewhat troublesome. He was eventually sent to Moreton <coughs> Bay Penal Colony, from which he absconded repeatedly. Um, and on one of those escapades, he spent a couple of years living up around the Nimboida area. And when he came down to Port Macquarie uh, at the end of that period, he, he secured his remission by offering advice about natural resources and so on, which were to be which were to be uh, were there to be taken by the European settlers at the uh, along this big river. Of course, speaking of the Clarence, as a Lismore boy, I have to acknowledge that the Clarence is bigger than the Richmond, the big river. So it's interesting. The first Muslim, the, sorry, the first the first non-indigenous person to be um, active in the Clarence Valley and, and our region was in fact a Muslim 
of non-European background, an Indian Muslim, which itself is a fairly rare beast, of course, these days. Then we move into the period of the so-called Afghan camel drivers, uh, mid to late 19th century, when, of course, people were, people were being brought in because of their expertise in um, dry country transport services. And we had, went from that from which we acquired not only a small Afghan Muslim population, but also ultimately herds of camels, which we are managing to sell to the Middle East because they don't have some of the diseases which are endemic in the local camel stock in the Middle East. So the idea that Aussies are selling camels to Saudi Arabia, I think, is almost akin to selling ice blocks to Eskimos. Yeah. You know, there's, there's some ingenuity or good luck in all of that. Point being that Muslims have been part of the process of opening up this country and establishing modern Australia as we know it. This was greatly limited after Federation in 1900 when the white Australia policy excluded, and watch the words here, non-European Muslims, which meant, of course, that European Muslims from the Balkans and Albania and so on were able to emigrate. But uh, Muslims who were not of European background were not able to emigrate. So again, there, there's a continuous story of Muslim presence in um, the early history of modern Australia. After 1975, the uh, migration policy is somewhat opened up and, and um, uh, made more open and progressive. And this is the period of Lebanese migration. And it's not often remembered that more than half of the Lebanese who came were Christian Lebanese. Okay, but still, famously, the Lebanese Muslim Association has its origins really in this period. And of course, is a particularly well-resourced Muslim community in some parts of Sydney. And it's one of the two major Islamic organisations in New South Wales. Um, by the way, the fact that it was 40%, 60% roughly reflects the, um, the population diversity of Lebanon in the 1930s and the ongoing fiction of Lebanese political arrangements. They haven't had a census since because they know the numbers are not like that these days and they have a deal. In the more recent period, 1990s and onwards, we get a much more inclusive immigration policy and, and also much more inclusive refugee policies as Australia moved away from only sourcing um, Anglo or at least white Europeans. And so we find that there's more diversity as well as greater numbers of Muslims in the Australian population. I'll get to the numbers in a moment. But we become increasingly a more diverse population as the number of kebab shops around the shopping centres of Australia tell us. Okay. Um, and they haven't all come from Cairo. So you know, there's, there's something going on here. So what, what are the numbers? Well, in the most recent census, which was in 2016, the national level, there were just over 600,000 Muslims identifying as such um, in the census. Um, that represents 2.6% of the Australian population captured in the census and a, a small but significant increase from 2.2% five years earlier. So despite some of the rhetoric in the social media and other places, we are not being overrun by Muslims and it wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing if we were. But this is a very small percentage of the overall population. More recently, of course, I'll be digging into the um, numbers for the Clarence Valley and also for here. In Clarence Valley, the whole statistical local government area, the Clarence Valley, in 2016, there were 43 Muslims. That's not a lot of people in a population of 50 odd thousand, 50,671. And it's part of the reason it was so hard to make contact with that community after the Christchurch shootings. It's a very small community. Many of them, of course, are actually visiting medical professionals who perhaps are not here for the long haul, but have come to the, come to the valley to, on government contracts and they work in the health services uh, um, in Grafton throughout the Clarence Valley. They represent 0.08% of a population which in the case of the Clarence Valley is overwhelmingly Anglo uh, and mostly born locally as well. 
so certainly thin on the ground in the Clarence. And in the Coffs Harbour statistical area, in 2016, 466 people identified as Muslims out of a population of almost 73,000. And if you do a quick calculation, that's 0.6%, which is still way below the national New South Wales average, but, but many, many times larger, of course, than the, um, the, than the population data from the Clarence Valley. So just mentioning those so we get some sense that, yes, there are Muslims living alongside us, but there aren't many. And certainly in Grafton, you can go to the shopping world day after day after day and not be aware of any Muslims. Certainly women in hijab are, are quite rare in Grafton. It's partly because they're sending their husbands to shop because of the nastiness of some of the white people in Grafton, sadly. Same kind of game here, but now let's look at just a, just a, a grab bag of 10 or so key dates out of, out of the, the, the story that Muslims and Christians would share to some degree. And these are not necessarily uh, characters or events which are absolutely historical, but they are significant milestones um, in the story of faith, whether we're talking about Jews or Christians or Muslims. So around about 2,000 years ago is when the three traditions would locate um, Abraham or Ibrahim. Um, so that's you know 4,000 years ago, basically, uh, according to the traditional dates. When we come to Moses or Musa, we're, we're dealing with a date round about 1,300 in the tradition. We don't know exactly when those stories are best dated, but something round about 1,300 is a fairly commonly accepted date for the, for the traditions relating to Moses. That's a big jump, by the way, isn't it? That's 700 years. A lot of water could flow under the bridge in 700 years. Not that there's many bridges with water in the Middle East. Somewhere in the 900s is where, the, where some biblical scholars would place uh, characters like David and Solomon, Daoud and Suleiman ibn Daoud. Uh, so somewhere in the 10th century, not quite a thousand years before Jesus. Jesus himself, the death of Jesus, Easter time, takes place in April of the year 30, the Common Era. So Isan ibn Maryam, Jesus of Nazareth, um, his earthly life ends uh, round about the year 30, roughly 2,000 years ago, of course. Muhammad himself, peace be upon him, his, the dates for his life are 570 to 632. So that's about, um, it's about 60 years um, that he's lived. So again, an interesting point. Jesus probably didn't live much longer than 30 years, 30, 35, something like that. Really, very difficult to date. Muhammad, like a number of other spiritual leaders, the Buddha amongst them, had a much more extended period of time during which his ideas were developed and his influence was spread under his own guidance. So approximate date for Muhammad's uh, the late 6th century, early decades of the 7th century of the Common Era, AD in the old coins. The um, revelation of the earliest surah from the Holy Quran is, is dated to around about 610, so about 20 years or so before the end of Muhammad's life, when he's about 40 years of age. Um, and interesting, those sort of numbers, 40 days, 40 nights, 40 weeks, 40 years, these, of course, are good biblical um, phrases, traditional phrases. The flight to Medina, or the Hijra, uh, is 622. And then um, 10 years later, of course, is going to be the death of the prophet. 10 years after the Hajj, or 632 in Western chronology. I want to mention two other dates. There could be there are many, many, many other dates we could mention, but there are two others I want to specifically mention. One is the uh, surrender of Jerusalem in six thirty-two, six, sorry six thirty-seven of the Common Era. Jerusalem surrenders. Sorry, I thought I'd drop that, but it was a. I was looking to see what I'd bumped on the floor, but it wasn't me at all. Uh, so six thirty-seven, or fifteen years after the Hajj, five years after Muhammad's death. 
Omar, who's at that stage the caliph, uh, comes to Jerusalem to accept the surrender of the holy city. And interestingly, the residents of Jerusalem welcomed the Muslims as uh, people who were liberating them from the, um, from the uh, burden of the taxation and other regulatory procedures of the Byzantine Empire. So the, while the city resisted um, the siege, when it came time to surrender, um, the, um, uh, the process was quite peaceful. And, and the, perhaps the sort of classic story which captures the spirit of the time is not only that the Patriarch of Jerusalem, because the Greek Orthodox Patriarch of Jerusalem, not only said, I will surrender the city, but only to the Caliph, not to one of his commanders. But secondly, um, the Patriarch invited Omar to come into the Church of the Resurrection, which in the West we know as the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which tells us a world about our mindset as Western Christians. Church of the Resurrection, Church of the Holy Tomb. Yeah. Who's got a problem here? Invited Omar to come in and pray. And in, in the legend, Omar declines to pray in the church. because He said, if I do, my followers will knock it down and build a mosque here. So he prays outside the Holy Sepulchre. And now the mosque of Omar is on that spot. Um, so again, that's, uh, that's a story which, of course, it was to the advantage of the Christian residents to keep telling that story. But it appears to have some basis in reality. In fact, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Church of the Resurrection, was remained standing for at least another 300 years until a mad caliph from Egypt ordered the destruction of the, of, uh, of the church. And then a few years later, his son authorised its reconstruction. So the story of you know, the relationship of Muslims and Christians, even to Jerusalem, is rather more complex and subtle. I just want to finish this list of dates by jumping down to the First Crusades, 1096 through to 1099. We have the, the period of the First Crusade when Jerusalem is recaptured by the Christian forces that had come from Europe, ostensibly to assist the Byzantine Empire, but in fact to take property and land and territory from the Byzantine Empire and set up their own empires, the um, Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem. So I hope those dates just give you a, a bit of a kind of a framework. Um, they don't explain everything about the present, but they do give us a little bit of the backstory of the relationship, historical relationship and the intertwined story of Jews, Christians and Muslims. So what can we say about the early reactions by Christian people to Islam? Well, perhaps the first thing to note is that Islam developed in areas of the Middle East which were beyond the political and economic control of the Byzantines. The reason that's significant is that it means that the Council of Nicaea, 325, the Council of Chalcedon, 451, had no remit in the parts of the Christian world which were outside the Byzantine Empire. They were councils called and summoned and presided over by the emperor. Okay? And they were part of the imperial political settlement um, at the time. And, and in the Oriental churches, as we call them, I think that phrase is going to come up there, the Oriental Christians, sometimes maligned by us referring to them as Nestorians, that's a, a value-laden phrase, of course, um, had a non-Chalcedonian understanding. They were still working with a simpler and less philosophically worked through understanding of both God and of Jesus. And that, that I think is significant because what we find developing in early Islam is an understanding which emphasizes the unity of God, which is exactly what the Oriental Christians were doing, and, and was much more diffident about affirming the eternal divinity of Jesus, which again is what the Eastern Oriental Christians were much more inclined to hold back from. So the um, the theological DNA of of the um, of the of the of early Islam is not remarkably different from the theological DNA of Oriental Christianity or indeed of Middle Eastern Judaism, 
which was also present in Arabia at the time. So just bear in mind, there's this kind of, they're, they're all drinking from the same theological water. There's a there's certain amount of cultural and theological commonality there. The, um, what was happening, of course, uh, under the leadership of Muhammad was not only a development of Islam, but the unification and the invigoration of the Arabic tribes, particularly from the Arabian Peninsula. And although I almost got thrown out of Nazareth for saying this at one stage, it is in fact correct that the, the people who today live in Nazareth or any of the other cities in Syria and in Palestine and in Israel are not ethnic Arabs. They're not from Arabia. They're the local people of Palestine who, as I'll say in a moment, adopted Arabic identity somewhere in the 7th and 8th century. Okay? So um, they wanted me to tell them that their ancestors in the time of Jesus were Arabs and they were living in Nazareth. And I said, well, your ancestors may have been living in Nazareth, but they were probably Jewish. They were not Arabs in that sense. So what's going on here is that the political dynamics were between the Byzantine Empire, based in Constantinople, Istanbul, and, and the Persians to the east. And that was the, that was the international conflict of the time. And the Arab tribes will be played off by either the Parthians or the Byzantines against the other side until under the leadership of Muhammad and those who followed him, the Arabs were unified and became a significant military and economic force in their own right. And that changes, of course, rewrites the map of the Middle East and indeed of North Africa within a very, very brief period of time. As I mentioned, when the Islamic armies arrived in Jerusalem and it was obvious that they were going to take the city and the Byzantines would not be rescuing them, um, the Christians welcomed um, the um, Islamic armies as liberators. It's helpful, I think, to remember that the, all of Palestine, all of Lebanon, all of Syria, all of North Africa, all of Egypt were Christian at that time. They, did not, they were not forcibly converted to Islam. They continued to practice as Christians and as Christian uh, politicians and economists and artists and administrators, they had significant roles in the early Islamic empires. Over time, uh, the Christian population diminished. But even in, in modern times, um, um, Egypt continues to have a substantial Coptic Christian minority um, even today, the realistic figures for Lebanon are about 35%, although the constitution says 50 um, In Jordan, leaving aside the Bedouin, who make up half of the country and are almost entirely Muslim, the Palestinian population, in other words, the non-Bedouin population of Jordan, uh, are 12% Christian. And that was the traditional number of Palestinian Christians you know, in the late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Christian population now in Israel, of course, and in Palestine, has been radically reduced as a percentage and also in raw numbers. Um, and that's partly to do with um, economic change, it's partly to do with birth control, and it's partly to do with migration for economic reasons to escape the Israeli occupation. So important to note that in the early years of the Caliphate, particularly, um, before, say, the Fatimid dynasty, um, Christians flourished in the Muslim world and increasingly chose to adopt Arabic identity. They moved all their literature, including the scriptures, from Aramaic across to Arabic. And, and in fact, there's a wealth of Christian commentaries on scripture written in Arabic which are basically inaccessible to most of us in the West. They also translated the classical text of the ancient world, the Latin and the Greek texts on architecture and medicine and philosophy and so on. They were translated into Arabic. They helped to inspire the cultural flourishing of the Islamic empires. And several hundred years later, they came back into Europe via Spain and helped to reinvigorate European culture. So again, there are fascinating stories of adoption and assimilation and cultural transfer going on. And it is certainly the case that today, uh, if you, for instance, if you meet a, a, um, a Christian 
um, Palestinian, they will say, well, I'm, I'm an Arab because their language and their culture and their food is Arab. Okay? It's actually Eastern Mediterranean, but they will say Arab. Um, their religion is, sorry, their nationality is Palestinian. Their religion is Christian. And if they live in Israel, they say, and my citizenship is Israeli. Arab, Palestinian, Christian, Israeli. Complex identities. It's been like that, of course, for a long time. This image is a beautiful image. It's St. Francis and the Sultan. Um, and you, some of you will know the story that the, the Francis decided to go to Egypt and to preach to the Sultan and, and to try and put an end to the conflict between um, uh, Christians and Muslims. Um, according to the legend, the Sultan said, if all the Christians were like you, we would not be fighting each other. Interesting point. But also, of course, the, um, the practical real estate outcome of that was that the Sultan put all the holy places in Palestine into the care of the Franciscans. And when you go to Israel today, you go to Palestine today, you'll find many, many of the holy sites are um, terra sancta. They belong to the Franciscan order and are looked after by the Franciscan order um, in the Holy Land. And that comes out of this meeting between Francis and the Sultan. From memory, he was the uh, nephew or grandson of Salah Adin, who was, the, uh, of course, the um, Islamic leader who, who threw the Crusaders out after the victory of the Horns of Hatim. So one way the Christians have, of course, regarded Islam, and I guess in many ways Jewish people might be inclined to take this, but it's really more a Christian point of view. Many Christians have regarded Islam as a deviant expression of religion and as a heretical text, Christianity gone bad, in a, in a nutshell, is one of the ways that traditionally, uh, particularly European Christians, have regarded Islam. Um, for that reason, particularly after the um, uh, expansion of the European colonial project in the 18th century and the 19th century, Muslims were often seen and treated as the objects of missionary activity. And that, of course, has also led to pushback and resistance. The desire to convert Muslims to Christianity remains very strong in some Christian circles. For Christian minorities in majority Muslim societies, that, of course, was not an option. You weren't going to take on that task. Okay? You, 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 you um, developed ways of living within the boundaries which were acceptable to the wider society. And they became stricter in the classical Islamic period. They were relatively generous and open-ended uh, in the time of the Prophet and the immediate um, successors. But then when you get down to the, down to the so classical um, Islamic empires, you find that the, um, the Islamic jurists are much more strict about the treatment of the Christian minorities. So... If, uh, but certainly Christians in the Middle East have more than a thousand years of practice at living successfully in a Muslim society. As I mentioned, once, um, once, once we get the more, you know, more recent developments in economics and technology and so on, we find that there are some places in the world where Christians and Muslims are competing for missionary outreach to communities which are neither Christian or Muslim. Uh, and this is in East Africa. This is the communities below the Tetsi Fly Line, um, where you've got Islam down to basically what is now called Sudan, northern Sudan. But beyond that point, Islam had not successfully spread until very, very recent times. And similarly, of course, in West Africa, in places like Nigeria, where the north of the country is solidly Islamic, and the Christians are expanding up into the north. And the Muslims, of course, are pushing further to the south. And so um, movements like Boko Haram, which I guess is pidgin Arabic in a sense, um, like pidgin English in New Guinea, Boko Haram is book, Boko Haram, disgusting, evil, horrible. Okay, So uh, you've got this kind of conflict going on there where uh, both Muslims and Christian communities are expanding into what you might call uh, missionary work amongst um, new tribes, new communities of people that have not traditionally been either Muslim or Christian. And there we find uh, 
the conflict can be quite raw, quite violent. And that feeds into some of the propaganda we see in the West as well. With the European colonial expansion, um, uh, Islam was culturally disadvantaged. Was uh, The impression given was that the West was good and advanced and superior and the Muslim world was decadent and inferior and corrupt. Um, and of course, and this is certainly what, partly what happened in Palestine, I'm sure it happened in other places as well, as well there were economic benefits to people who either were Christian or became Christian, got jobs with the colonial administration, or in the case of the mandate period in um, Palestine, there were advantages to Greek Orthodox people who became Church of England during the time of the British mandate, which is why there's an Anglican church in Palestine of all places, although almost every priest's grandfather was Greek Orthodox previously. So you can see what's been happening there. Well, the same dynamic was affecting, uh, impacting on sort of Muslim communities as well. So there was a kind of a, a perception that progress was an attribute of the West and decadence and corruption was an attribute of, of the Islamic world in the eyes of these um, um, conquering Europeans. But there was an unexpected consequence, of course, as we've noticed, is that in the last hundred years or so, there have been increasing numbers of people from the empire who are actually finding futures back in the centre, back in the home where the empire came from. And I guess that first um, non-Indigenous person who lived on our, in our area, he's an example of that. As early as the 1820s, he had not only he'd, he'd moved from India to the UK, got into trouble with the UK authorities and ended up being transported to Australia. And we know there has been a significant um, migration of um, uh, Indonesians to the Netherlands and of um, people from East Africa and West Africa, Caribbean, uh, and this is, uh, from India and Pakistan and so on, into um, the UK, France, etc. So the geographical kind of distancing of the Muslim world and the Christian world has shrunk at both ends. Not only did the Europeans go out and, and put their footprints everywhere, but they actually triggered a, an, another movement, as happened with the Roman Empire, of course. If you go out and create an empire, then you're going to bring people from the empire back into the heart of the home society. So we, we've, we find the stage is set for um, a complex complex world. And I'm not, not particularly going to focus on the Crusades, but of course the Crusades are indeed one of the um, important points in this story. I want to focus more on the modern tensions, the tensions between Islam in the West in the last 40 or 50 years. Remember back to 1979, seems a long time ago, uh, a person who was very seemed very strange to most of us in the West, Ayatollah Khomeini, rose to prominence as part of the Iranian revolution. The Shah was sent packing, and the political order in the Middle East and in the Persian Gulf was completely turned on its head. America was the great Satan, remember. And uh, um, staff of the American, con American embassy were, were taken captive and an attempt to rescue them didn't work out. I mean, so many things, so many assumptions were being turned on their head at that time. And since then, there's been a more or less continuous series of incidents which have either exacerbated or illustrated the contemporary tensions between many contemporary expressions of Islam and, and the West. Um, when we look at the character of some of the local nationalist movements, whether that's in Egypt or Malaysia or Indonesia or in Turkey, we can, we can see a uh, characteristically uh, one of the ways in which they retrieve their identity is to become more intentionally observant of their Islamic traditions. And the most visible sign of that, of course, are women choosing to wear the hijab uh, as, a, as a, yes, as an expression of faith, but also as an expression of cultural identity and national identity.
So there's been that kind of current, and we see it, for example, in Turkey. We've also seen it in more recent years in um, Indonesia and before that in Malaysia. And then we've seen the development of this phenomenon of Islamophobia, the, the fear of Islam infecting Western media and Western culture, and in many cases, Western churches. And this, I think, peaked around the time of the first Gulf War, but then it's had top-up doses with the 9-11 attacks, the second Gulf War, the attacks of the war in Afghanistan, and, and of course, other um, incidents that have happened in the meantime. So just let's just reflect on some of these. So you've got the 9-11 events, you've got the rise of Al-Qaeda, and of course before 9-11 there were a number of other uh, Al-Qaeda attacks on Western and particularly, particularly American um, installations and facilities. We've had the war and the struggle with the Taliban and Al-Qaeda uh, in Afghanistan, and you would think having watched the Soviets um, come to grief with the Mujahideen, we might have figured out there wasn't a lot of point going in there, but nonetheless, off we all went. Um, following the second Gulf War and the, and the collapse and even dismemberment of Iraq, um, we've seen the rise of sectarian violence. We've seen the fragmentation of Iraq, which itself was a colonial creation, like most of the Arab states. French and British people had rulers and pencils and said, well, this bit's ours, that bit's yours, and so on. And, um, and so that, that uh, turmoil, which has been flowing um, in Iraq for several years now, of course, with the uh, uh, Shia and the Sunni areas and the Kurds in the north, have, have reinforced a Western perception that um, yeah, these people are dangerous in the way we often hear it being spoken about in political discourse. ISIS was perhaps the uh, ultimate crystallization of that, um, and, and which included the, the treatment of Christian minorities in places like Mosul and, and other centers in northern Iraq and northern Syria. And while the ISIS, while Daesh and the Caliphate have gone, presumably, um, the legacy of that, the fear, the anxiety, the, uh, the quick recourse to national security as a, as a political tactic in Australian politics is part of the legacy of all that. We've seen violence become almost normative against Western, Western Muslims, whether that's somebody commenting on a woman who's wearing a hijab or trying to rip it off her head, uh, whether it's legislation in France to ban, to, to ban the hijab. Um, there are any, any number of examples we could quickly draw together of violence against Muslims in Western communities where as much as anybody else, they're seeking to create a better future for themselves and their children. Um, and, and of course, the most extreme recent example of that was the shooting at the mosques in Christchurch. Um, obviously, uh, violence directed against Muslims who were citizens of New Zealand uh, by um, a white extremist who we don't like to use those words because he's one of ours but a white extremist who, who was motivated apparently by racist and religious um, prejudice. We've seen, the, we've seen the effectiveness of using concern about immigration levels as a dog whistle to say we, don't, we only want our kind of people coming here. Remember going to the um, um, Caritas uh, Refugee Centre in Amman a couple of years ago and the local people, the office people there, were so excited because the Australian government has just said it would take 20,000 Christian refugees from Syria. And they were so excited to have an Aussie in the building because my government was doing such wonderful things. And I was going, oh, this is really embarrassing. Um, refugees are refugees. Um, we should not be biased. We should not be um, preferencing one particular community over another simply on the basis of religion. But we've seen the, um, the way it plays out in the, in the recent New South Wales election and in the federal election, the, the, the way in which um, immigration and protecting our culture has become a cipher for we don't want any Muslims here or we don't want any more Muslims here. 
And of course, they've also, we've also seen pushback and acts of violence perpetrated by Muslims against Westerners, whether that be the bombing in Bali or the attacks in Paris. And you know, we can go down a long list of places where uh, atrocities have happened with the victims being either Muslim or Westerners, as the case may be. So we know there's a, a tragic recent history there. Um, and behind that is another couple of hundred years of Western arrogance as we trampled all over the Middle East. So let's do a little bit of uh, rethinking our, our um, some points where we might rethink our Christian views of Islam. I just want to mention four or five key theological points where I hope we might um, be kind of inspired to, to think afresh and to affirm what we have in common. The image, by the way, is from the Al Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. But look at the window. What does the window tell to you? Tell you? It's a Gothic window. It's a Christian window in the Al Aqsa Mosque. Because during the Crusades, while Omar did not turn the Church of the Resurrection into a mosque, we turned uh, the Dome of the Rock into a church dedicated to the Trinity calculated to insult Muslims. And we uh, turned the Al Aqsa Mosque um, into a, a, a Christian cathedral and of course the Knights Templar uh, because of, they believed it was a temple of, of, of Jerusalem. The historical sense was not very well developed. They saw this dirty big building, this must be the temple of Jerusalem. So the Knights Templar come out of that. So parts of the building actually still reflect uh, periods when um, Christians have taken over this property and shaped it around our sense of beauty, our sense of architecture. Whereas the window below it is much more a classic um, Islamic window, beautiful colours. So let's, let's start with the big one, as it were, Allah. If you go to church anywhere in Palestine, the Christians refer to God as Allah. It is simply the word for God. Okay? Um, Christians in the Middle East don't argue about whether or not Muslims and Christians and Jews are worshipping the same God. That's a given. That's simply taken for granted. Now, I know there will be churches in Coffs Harbour, as there are in Grafton, who will say, no, Muslims are not worshipping the same God as us. Well, I think we have to listen to what the other person says if they say they're worshipping the same God, and if the word they use is the same word that Christian Arabs use for God, then we might recognise that we understand God differently, but we should at least recognise we are relating to and seeking to worship and serve the same God. After all, how many Christians have exactly the same understanding of God or of salvation? So I hope we can... Um, easily embrace the suggestion that Allah is the God worshipped by Jews, Christians and Muslims, even though we understand God differently in some respects. Thy kingdom come. That's a, a Christian phrase, of course. It comes out of the Lord's Prayer. But the very essence of Islam is submission to the will of God, which we could paraphrase as your kingdom done, come, as it, and in the more familiar Mathean form of the prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. That's a prayer that any Muslim could say. Okay. Perfectly kosher, to mix another metaphor, perfectly kosher prayer from Christians and Muslims. Seeking God's will being done on earth is the very essence of Judaism, life under the covenant, very essence of the Lord's Prayer for Christians and, of course, the essence of Islam. We have so much in common. Creation. Um, in, the, in, in the Jewish and the Christian tradition, but also in the Quran, not only is creation something which God brings into being, but humans are created as stewards. And in the Quran, the term that's used is khalifa which later on become, becomes caliph, but the original and one of the core meanings of caliph remains to be a steward, somebody who's responsible for, 
somebody who's nurturing creation. And as we think about the challenges of living faithfully on this planet and in this web of life, to see ourselves as Khalifa, as stewards of creation, not as masters of creation, but stewards of creation, is something else that we might claim in common. We form communities of practice which are remarkably similar in terms of their structure. Christians and Muslims, and Jews for that matter, gather to pray. We gather to read and study and reflect on our sacred texts. We value and nurture our families. We practice charity and care for those in need. And in all of those traditions, the idea of a pilgrimage, of a journey to a place of spiritual significance is important, although it takes, of course, very different forms. For Jews, it's Jerusalem and perhaps Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. For Christians, um, pilgrimage is less significant, but we value the opportunity to go to various holy sites, particularly in the Holy Land. And for Muslims, of course, to be on the Hajj to Mecca is one of the great um, blessings of the spiritual life. Again, we, the, so the DNA, the kind of structure of what we're doing is, is so very, very similar. And yes, there are differences, but I noticed with great delight that uh, a few weeks ago now, around Easter time, when some churches were blown up in Sri Lanka, the response of one of the local mosques to the Catholic Church was, come and have your mass in our mosque. Celebrate the table, Almaida. Celebrate the mysteries of the body and blood of Christ in the mosque. Okay, um, there's there's often a hospitality there that we we um, we overlook because we see the differences. And of course, when we think about the future, uh, Muslims and Christians have similar expectations about where this is all heading, what the point of creation is, what God's purposes for us are at the end of time. And what, what Christians are mostly unaware is that for Muslims, when we get to that day, the judge of the world is not Muhammad, but Issa, Jesus. His day will come when he will be the judge of the world. He's not the co-eternal son of God for Muslims, but he is the judge at the end of time. So again, there's so many structural and really profound commonalities between Muslims and Christians, just very, very quickly. So what about an agenda then for affection between our communities? One of the things we can surely be doing is to invest in strengthening the multi-faith character and diversity of Australia, celebrating the fact that we are not monochrome, that we're vibrant and multicultural and, and multi-faith. At the local level, let's not be strangers to each other. Let's make friends with one another. A few months ago, I was in Sydney for a, a meeting and uh, I was caught up with a, uh, a local um, Muslim woman down there that I'd met through a friend with phone calls and various things. And we went out for dinner. She came into town, picked me up. We went out to dinner to one of the swankiest restaurants under the Sydney Harbour Bridge. She's in her uh, hijab and I'm dressed like this. The conversation kind of stopped. The Muslim and the weirdo priest walk into the restaurant and we sat there laughing and talking and joking and obviously having a lovely time together. And people are going, what's with, <laughs> what's with them? Okay, let's be friends locally. Let's not be strangers to each other. Let's promote social harmony. And this, of course, is one of the agendas for our part of the country, particularly in the aftermath of the Christchurch shooting and there will be anniversaries coming up, there will be court cases coming up, and we need to be gently, constructively promoting social harmony and tolerance. We didn't succeed in gathering the local Grafton Muslims for an iftar, uh, a special meal at the end of the Ramadan fast at the cathedral, but I was really surprised when the local media said, but how can Muslims be coming into the cathedral? How can that be happening? I said, well, it's just not an issue. I can go into mosques, they can come into churches. We're friends. We have a place for each other. 
in each other's holy places. We of course need to be engaged in a process of education, whether that be in our schools, amongst our own people. As, as a Christian leader, I need to make sure that my parishioners have healthy and positive attitudes towards Muslims, towards Sikhs, towards Baha'i, etc. And of course, in the wider society, we have, a, we have a responsibility to work together, an agenda for affection that demonstrates to the wider society how much we have in common. Because of our commitment, well, because we're humans and because we live on the planet, let alone our theology, we have a natural agenda item in the area of environment, being Khalifa, being stewards of creation, as we read in Genesis 1 and Genesis chapter 2. And, and, and there is huge amount of work we can do in the sphere of environmental care and eco-justice, and particularly as rising sea levels and climate change generate new waves of refugees. And surely Christians and Muslims should be in the front line of offering hospitality and help. Compassion and social justice is just another instance of that same kind of collaboration for the good of others and for the honour of God. I've often said to groups coming through Jerusalem, which of course is supposed to be the city of peace, imagine if Jews and Christians and Muslims got our act together in Jerusalem. Okay? Instead of being a masterclass in hatred, imagine if we made Jerusalem a masterclass in compassion and tolerance and peace. Of course, in humanitarian aid and international development, lots is already happening. Um, but again, there's there's huge amount of scope. There's huge scope for us to be doing things together and not needing to kind of um, try and subvert the other person and say, look at us, look at us. Let's, let's back each other up. Let's celebrate each other's achievements for the sake of those that we're helping. Violence against women and the violence against other vulnerable persons, again, is, a really, I think, a really important uh, agenda for Muslims and Christians to speak to. Um, sharing. Um, in the West we tend to have a whole lot of assumptions about how women are treated in Islam. Have you noticed how well women are treated in the Christian West? Okay, yeah. Let's not be too precious here. Um, sure there are cultural variations but we, we, need to, we need to be working together to protect the dignity and the well-being of every person especially those that are more vulnerable. And of course as People who value spiritual realities, how, what's it mean to be human in a world of increasing <coughs> technology, artificial intelligence, 24-7 surveillance, facial recognition, etc., etc.? How do we speak for the dignity of the carbon-based life form in a digital world? So I want to finish with this, um, a quote, it's a long quote, but I'll just... I'll read it quickly and then there's a two-liner on the next screen. This is from a document called A Common Word, which was issued a few years ago now, just a handful of years ago, by a representative gathering of Muslim leaders. Finding common ground between Muslims and Christians is not simply a matter for polite ecumenical dialogue between selected religious leaders. Christianity and Islam are the largest and second largest religions in the world, and in history. Christians and Muslims reportedly make up over a third and over a fifth of humanity, respectively, and together make up more than 55% of the world's population, making the relationship between these two religious communities the most important factor in contributing to meaningful peace around the world. If, Christ if Muslims and Christians are not at peace, the world cannot be at peace. With the terrible weaponry of the modern world, with, Christ with Muslims and Christians intertwined everywhere as never before, no side can unilaterally win a conflict between more than half the world's inhabitants. Our common future is at stake. The very survival of the world itself is perhaps at stake. And then this final brief note, so let our differences not cause hatred and strife between us. Let us vie with, with each other only in righteousness and good works. Let us respect each other 
be fair, just and kind to one another and live in sincere peace, harmony and mutual goodwill.